Katie again. We are reading Ursula K. Le Guin's book, No Time to Spare. And we are on page 29, Chosen by a Cat, April 2012. In the four months since I wrote about his arrival, little Pard has grown up. He is now not large, but quite solid Pard. He's what they call a cobby cat, not a leggy one. When he sits upright, the view from the rear is pleasingly symmetrical, symmetrically globular, a shining black sphere plus head and tail. But he isn't fat, though not for one of try, trying. He still loves kibbles. Oh, kibbles. Oh, lovely kibbles. Crunch, crunch, crunch to the last crumb. Then look up with instant, infinite pathos. I starve, I perish, I have not eaten for weeks. He would love to be Pardo Elardo. We are heartless. One half cup of food a day, the vet said, and we have obeyed her. One quarter cup of kibbles at seven, another at five. And well, yes, there is a sixth of a can of cat food with warm water on it for lunch to make sure he gets plenty of water. But he often leaves that till five when the kibbles arrive, the one true food. And then he cleans both bowls and goes into the living room and maybe flies around a bit, but mostly just sits and digests in bliss. He is a vivid little creature. Youth is so dramatic. His tuxedo is utterly black and utterly white. He is utterly sweet and utterly nutty, wild as a bronco, inert as a sloth. One moment he's airborne, the next fast asleep. He is unpredictable, yet keeps strict routines. Every morning he rushes over to greet Charles coming downstairs, falls over on the hall rug, and waves his paws in a posture of adoration. He still won't sit on a lap, though. I don't know if he ever will. He just doesn't accept the lap hypothesis. Getting waked up by 20 minutes of strong, steady purring is very nice, plus the nose that investigates the neck, the paws that pat the hair, the increasing intensity of purr, the commencement of, by, of pouncing. By then, it's quite easy to get up. Then he rushes into the bathroom ahead of me and flies around, mostly about waist level, getting into things, and he plays with the water I run for him in the bathtub and then leaps out to make wet flower paw prints here and there, or if I dribble him water in the wash basin, he closes the stopper, thus creating a water hole where savage panthers may crouch and wait for dictics and gazelles or possibly beetles. Then we go downstairs, one flying, the other not. Closing the drain is typical. He's clever at opening cabinets, too. Because he likes getting into things, anything that can be got into, cabinets, drawers, boxes, bags, sacks, a quilt in progress, a sleeve, he is ingenious, adventurous, and determined. We call him the good cat with bad paws. The paws get him into trouble and that cause loud shouting, scoldings, and seizures and removals, which the good cat endures with patient good humor. What are they carrying on about? I didn't knock that over. A paw did. There used to be a lot of small, delicate things on shelves around the house. There aren't now. Charles bought him a red, little red harness. He is incredibly patient about having it put on. We thought it would be Charles the bloody-handed for weeks, but no. He even purrs somewhat plaintively during the harnessing. Then the bungee le leash is attached, and they go out and down the back steps into the garden for Pard's walk. It went quite well twice. Then a man running by outside the fence, slapping his feet down, galump, galump, scared Pard, and he wanted to go back inside at once, and is only beginning to get unscared of all the weirdness out there. I think when it stops raining and we can sit outdoors with him, it will be okay. He needs open space to fly around in, that's for sure. But then, of course, we fear he may get too bold in his enthusiasm and ignorance and wander into the wild backyards and thickets down the hill or chase a bird out into the street and so get lost or meet the enemy. The enemy comes in so many forms of, to cats. They are small animals, predators, yet very vulnerable. And Pard has neither street smarts nor wilderness wisdom, but he's bright. He deserves what freedom we can give him, once it stops raining. Meanwhile, he usually spends a good part of the day with me in my study, sleeping on the printer about a foot from my right elbow. He fixated on me to start with and still tends to follow me up and down stairs and keep nearby, though he's gaining more independence, which is good. If I wanted to be the center of the universe, I'd have a dog. 
My guess is that for the first year of his life in a small and crowded household, he was never alone, so he needs time to get used to solitude as well as to silence, boredom, never getting pursued or squashed by a passionate baby, etc. Not wanting to be the center of the universe doesn't mean I don't love having a cat nearby. It seems we got his name right. He's a partner, true companion. I really like it when he sleeps at the top of my head on the pillow, sort of like a fur nightcap. The only trouble with his sleeping on the printer is that it's six inches from my time machine, which when it's saving stuff makes a weird tiny humming clicking noise exactly like beetles. Pard knows that there are beetles in that box. Nothing I can say will change his mind. There are beetles in that box, and one day he will get his paw into it and get the beetles out and eat them. I'm guessing her time machine's like a big hard drive thing. Part two, the lit biz. <laughs> so this is March 2011. Would you please fucking stop? I keep reading books and seeing movies where nobody can fucking say anything except fuck, unless they say shit. I mean, they don't seem to have any adjective to describe fucking, to describe fucking except fucking, even when they're fucking fucking. And shit is what they say when they fucked. When shit happens, they say shit, or oh shit, or oh shit, we're fucked. The imagination involved is staggering. I mean, literally. There was one novel I read where the novelist didn't only make all the fucking characters say fuck and shit all the time, but she got into the fucking act herself for shit's sake. So it was full of deeply moving shit, like the sunset was just too fucking beautiful to fucking believe. I guess what's happened is that what used to be a shock word has become a noise that's supposed to intensify the emotion in what you're saying. Or maybe it occurs just to bridge the gap between words, so the actual words become the shit that happens in between saying fucking. Swear words and shock words used to mostly come out of religion. Damn, damn it, hell, God, God damn, God damn, to, God damn it to hell, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Almighty. Do I have to put like a child warning on this? If I share it on YouTube, we'll see. A few of them appeared rarely in 19th century novels, usually as, or more bravely, as by G dash exclamation point or D dash N exclamation point. Archaic or dialectic oaths such as such as swoons, egad, gorbliny were printed out in full. With the 20th century of religious blasphemy oaths begin, began to creep and then swarm into print. Censorship of words perceived as sexually explicit was active far longer. Lewis Gannett, the book reviewer for the old New York Herald Tribune, had a top secret list of words the publisher had had to eliminate from the Grapes of Wrath before they could print it. After dinner one night, Lewis read the list out loud to his family and mine with great relish. It couldn't have shocked me much because I recall only a boring litany of boring words mostly spoken by the Joads, no doubt, on the general shock level of titty. It's not very shocking. I remember my brothers coming home on leave in the Second World War and never once swearing in front of us homebodies, a remarkable achievement. Only later, when I was helping my brother Carl clean out the spring in which a dead skunk had languished over all winter, did I learn my first real cuss words, seven or eight of them in one magnificent, unforgettable lesson. Soldiers and sailors have always cursed. What else can they do? But Norman Mailer in The Naked and the Dead was forced to use the euphemistic invention fugging, giving Dorothy Parker the chance, which naturally she didn't miss, of cooing at him. Oh, are you the young man who doesn't know how to spell fuck? <laughs> and then came the 60s, 
when a, a whole lot of people started saying shit, even if they hadn't had lessons from their brother. And before long, all the shits and fucks were bounding forth in print. And finally, we began to hear from them, them from the lips of stars of Hollywood. So now the only place to get away from them is movies before 1990 or books before 1970 or way, way out in the wilderness. But make sure there aren't any hunters out in the wilderness about to come up to your bleeding body and say, Aw, oh, shit, man, I thought you was a fucking moose. I remember when swearing, though tame, by modern standards was quite varied and often highly characteristic. There were people who swore as an art form, performing a dazzling juncture of the inordinate and unexpected. It seems weird to me that only two words are now used as cuss words, and by many people used so constantly that they can't talk or even write without them. Of our two swear words, one has to do with elimination, the other, apparently, has to with sex. Both are sanctioned domains, areas like religion, where there are rigid limits and things may be absolutely off limits except at certain specific times or places. So little kids shout caca and doo doo, and big ones shout shit, put the feces where they don't belong. This principle, getting it out of place, off limits, the basic principle of swearing, I understand and approve. And though I really would like to stop saying, oh shit, when annoyed, having gotten on fine without it till I was 35 or so, I'm not yet having much success in regressing to, oh hell or damn it. There is something about the shh beginning and the explosive t ending and that quick little eh sound in between. But fuck and fucking, I don't know. Oh, they sound good as curses, too. It's really hard to make the word fuck sound pleasant or kindly. But what is that? But what is it saying? I don't think there are meaningless swear words. They wouldn't work if they were meaningless. Does fuck have to do with sex primarily, or sex as male aggression, or just aggression? Until maybe 25 or 30 years ago, as far as I know, fucking only meant one kind of sex. What the man does to a woman with or without consent. Now both men and women use it to mean coitus, and it's become, as it were, ungendered so that a woman can talk about fucking her boyfriend, so the strong connotations of penetration and of rape should have fallen away from it, but they haven't. Not to my ear, anyhow. Fuck is an aggressive word, a domineering word. When the guy in the Porsche shouts, fuck you, asshole, he isn't inviting you to an evening at his flat. When people say, oh shit, we're fucked, they don't mean we're having a consensual good time. The word has huge overtones of dominance, of abuse, of contempt, of hatred. So God is dead, at least as a swear word, but hate and feces keep going strong. Le roi est mort, vive le fucking roi. Reader's Questions, October 2011. I recently got a letter from a reader who, after saying he liked my books, said he was going to ask what might seem a stupid question, one I need not answer, though he really longed to know the answer to it. It concerned the wizard Ged's use name Sparrowhawk. He asked, is this the New World Sparrowhawk, Falco Sparvarius? or one of the Old World Kestrels, also Falco, or their Sparrowhawks, which are not Falco, but Accipiter. Warning, you can get into something of a tangle with these birds. Many people use the words Sparrowhawk, sparrowhawk and Kestrel interchangeably, but Kestrels, Eurasian or American, are all Falcons, while not all Sparrowhawks are Kestrels, or vice versa. Vice versa. You see what I mean. I am only sorry we lost the beautiful British name Windhover, but we have G. M. Hopkins' poem. Whew, I have never thought about sparrowhawks or kestrels. I like those words. I immediately answered the letter as best I could. I said, it seems to me it can't be any of the above because it's not an earth bird, but an earth sea bird and Linnaeus did not go there with his can of names. 
But the bird I saw in my imagination when I was writing the book was definitely like our splendid little American Spivarius, so maybe we could call it Falco Pau Parvulus Terramarinus. I didn't think of Parvulus small when I wrote the letter, but it should be there. A sparrow hawk is a quite small falcon. Ged was a strappy boy, but short. Oh my gosh, my voice is so itchy. I think I have allergies. A sparrow hawk is oh no, I read that. After I'd answered the letter, I thought about how promptly and with what pleasure I'd done so. And I looked at the never decreasing stack of letters waiting to be answered and thought how much I wanted to put off answering them because so many of them would be so difficult, some so impossible. Yet I very much wanted to answer them because they were written by people who liked or at least were responding to my work, had questions about it, and took the trouble to tell me so, and thus deserved the trouble and sometimes the pleasure of an answer. I can't have to blow my nose. Oh, I put the tissues here. Pause. What makes so many letters to the author hard to answer? What have the difficult ones in common? I've been thinking about it for some days. So far, I've come up with this. They ask large general questions, sometimes stemming from some branch of learning the writers know way, way more about than I do, such as philosophy or metaphysics or informational theory or they ask large general questions about how Taoism or feminism or Jungian psychology or information theory has influenced me. Questions unanswerable in some cases only with, <laughs> oh, some questions answerable in some cases only with a long PhD thesis and others only with not much, or else they ask large general questions based on large general misconceptions about how writers work, such as, where do you get your ideas from? What is the message of your book? Why did you write this book? Why do you write? This last question, which is in fact highly metaphysical, is often asked by young readers. Some writers, even ones who don't actually write for a living, answer it for money, which certainly stops all further discussion being the deadliest of dead ends. My honest answer for it is because I like to. But that's seldom what the questioner wants to hear or what the teacher wants to find in the book review or the term paper. They want something meaningful. Meaning, this is perhaps the common note, the bane I am seeking. What is the meaning of this book, this event in the book, this story? Tell me what it means. But that's not my job, honey, that's your job. I know at least in part what my story means to me it may well mean something quite different to you. And what it meant to me when I wrote it in 1970 may not at all be what it mean, meant to me in 1990 or means to me in 2011. What it meant to anybody in 1995 may be quite different from what it will mean in 2022. Almost there. <laughs> what it means in Oregon may be incomprehensible in Istanbul Yet in Istanbul, it may have a meaning I could never have intended. Meaning in art isn't the same as meaning in science. The meaning of the second law of thermodynamics, so long as the words are understood, isn't changed by who reads it or when or where. The meaning of Huckleberry Finn is. Writing is a risky business. Business. No guarantees. You have to take the chance. I'm happy to take it. I love taking it. So my stuff gets misread, misunderstood, misinterpreted. So what? 
If it's the real stuff, it will survive almost any abuse other than being ignored, disappeared, not read. What it means to you is what it means to you. If you have trouble deciding what, if anything, it means to you, I can see why you might want to ask me, but please don't. Read reviewers, critics, bloggers, and scholars. They all write about what books mean to them, trying to explain a book to achieve a valid common understanding of it useful to other readers. That's their job, and some of them do it wonderfully well. It's a job I do as a reviewer and enjoy it. But my job as a fiction writer is to write fiction, not to review it. Art isn't explanation. Art is what an artist does, not what an artist explains. Or so it seems to me, which is why I have a problem with the kind of modern museum art that involves reading what the artist says about a work in order to find out why one should look at it or how to experience it. I see a potter's job as making a good pot, not as talking about how and where and why she made it and what she thinks it's for and what other pots influenced it and what the pot means or how you should experience the pot. She can do that if she wants to, of course, but should she be expected to? Why? I don't expect her to. I don't even want her to. All I expect of a good potter is to go and make another good pot. <laughs> Feels like such a relief to read. A question such as the one about sparrowhawks. Not large, not general, not metaphysical, and not personal. A question of detail, of fact, in the case of fiction, imaginary fact. A limited specific question about a particular work is one most artists are willing to answer. And questions about technique, if limited and precise, can be intriguing for the artist to consider. Why did you use a mercury blaze? Or why do you, don't you write in the present tense, for instance? Large general questions about meaning, etc., can only be answered with generalities, which make me uncomfortable because it is so hard to be honest when you generalize. If you skip over all the details, how can you tell if you're being honest or not? But any question, if it is limited, specific, and precise, can be answered honestly. If only with, I honestly don't know, I never thought about it, now I have to think about it, thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm grateful for questions like that that keep me thinking. Now back to Hopkins and the wind hover. I caught this morning morning's minion, kingdom of daylight dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon in his writing, on the rolling level underneath him steady air and striding, high there. I have to read that again. This is an excerpt from her writing, I'm guessing. I caught this morning's morning, <laughs> I caught this morning morning's minion, kingdom of daylight dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon in his writing of the rolling level underneath him steady air and striding. Hi there. Ah, we could explain that and talk about what it means and why and how it does what it does forever. And we will, I hope, but the poet, like the falcon, leaves us to that leaves that to us, rather. Next chapter. Kids Letters, December 2013. People sometimes look surprised when I say that I love to get fan letters from children. I'm surprised that they're surprised. I get some very lovable letters from kids under 10 who write me on their own, mostly with a little parental input. They often describe themselves as your hugest fan which makes me imagine them as towering aimably over the Empire State Building, but most of the letters come from school classes that read the Cat Wings books. I tried to answer these letters at least by thanking every child by name. I can't usually do much more than that. Some are problematic. The teacher has told the kids to write an author, making the assignment a requirement without regard for the student's feelings or capabilities or mine. One desperate 10-year-old forced to write the forced to write the author told me, I have read the cover. It was pretty good. <laughs> what am I to say to him? His teacher put both him and me on the spot and left us there. Not fair. Frequently teachers tell the students to tell the author what their favorite part of the book is and to ask a question. The favorite part is fine. The kid can always fake it, but asking a question is pointless unless the student really has one. 
It's also inconsiderate, raising the impossible expectation that a working author can write back with answers to 25 or 30 different questions, even if most of them are variations on one, on two or three standard themes. When teachers let the kids write whatever they want, if they want to write anything, it works. The questions are real, though some of them would stump the sphinx. Why do the cat wings have wings? Why did you ever write books? <laughs> I want to know how you make some of the words on the cover slanted. My cat boo is nine. I am 10. How old is your cat? Is it fair to catch mice? And there are interesting criticisms. Kids are forthright, both, both positively and negatively. Their comments tell me with interest what interests and what disturbs them. Did James ever get better from the owl? I hate Mrs. Jane Tabby. She made her kittens go away from home. <laughs> the class mailings I enjoy most are those where the teacher has encouraged the kids to draw their own pictures of scenes in the book or to write sequels and continuations of the adventures of the cat wings. Cat Wings 5 and Cat Wings 6 on UrsulaKaylaGwin.com posted quite a while back are examples of one approach to this. The teacher is guided slash collaborated with the students in making up the story and has chosen the pictures to illustrate it. This is an admirable exercise in teamwork on an artistic project and the result is charming. Adult control, however, inevitably tames the wild unpredictability of stories and pictures that come straight from each child's imagination. Such illustrations, stories, and booklets give me almost unalloyed delight. The occasional alloy is in the now inevitable stories that Im imitate electronic games, a more alarming instance of adult control. In these, the cat wings go through a portal in the middle of an incoherent adventure involving battles and the slaughter of enemies, monsters, etc. by the million. Evidently, this is the only story the child knows. It's scary to see a mind trapped in an endless repetition of violent acts without meaning or resolution, only escalation to keep the stimulus going. So far, this kind of thing has only come from boys, which may be, in its way, a hopeful sign. I remember hearing my next older brother in 1937 making up and acting out his own adventure stories in his room. Shouts of defiance, muffled thuds, cries of get him, get him, and machine gun fire. My brother came through all this mayhem as a quite unviolent adult. But the games of instantly rewarded destruction in which the characters and actions are ready-made action figures and the only goal is winning are designed to be addictive and therefore can be hard to outgrow or replace. Compelled into an endless, meaningless feedback loop, the imagination is starved and sterilized. As for the joy I get from the stories and booklets, a large part of it is in seeing that so many kids are perfectly willing to write a book. The book may be about 50 words long. They are confident about doing it and about illustrating it. They take obvious pleasure in giving it chapters, in a table of contents, in a cover, in a dedication. And at the end, they all write the end with a proud flourish. They should be proud. Their teacher is proud of them. I am proud of them. I hope their family is proud of them. To have written a book is a very cool thing when you are six or eight or 10 years old. It leads to other cool things such as fearless reading. Why would anyone who's written a book be afraid of reading one? As an experienced connoisseur, I can say the best letters and books by kids are entirely home handmade. A computer may make writing easier, but that's not always an advantage. Ease induces haste and glibness. From the, point of, from the visual point of view, the printout, with all in idiosyncratic characters blended into a standard font, is drably neat, while the artisanal script is full of vitality. Computer spell checking takes out all the flavor out of the non-prescriptive creative spelling that can give great delight to the reader. In a printout, nobody tells me what their favorite part of the book is or their favorite part or favorite part or favorite part. In a printout, nobody asks me, we, did you decide 
to writ cat wigs. And there are no splendid final salutations such as censoral, <laughs> which I me stumped until sansurly and sinisterly gave me the clue, or yours trelly, or also spelled true, <laughs> C-H-R-U-L-E, or frequently echoing young Jane Austen, your friend, F-R-E-I-N-D, or the occasional totally mysterious farewells, most from Derek, horseway Anna. <laughs> First way, brave teachers, brave children, and thank you for the quotations. Muth from Ursula. <laughs> She's so funny. Okay. I'm going to read one more and then I think my time is going to run out on my phone storage. Having my cake. April 2012. The inability to understand proverbs is a symptom of something. Is it schizophrenia or paranoia? Anyhow, something very bad. When I heard that many years ago, it worried me. Everything I heard about a symptom worries me. Do I have it? Yes. Yes, I do. Oh, God. And I have proof of my paranoia or schizophrenia. There was a very common proverb that I knew I would never understood. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. My personal logic said, how can you eat a cake you don't have? And since I couldn't argue with that, I silently stuck to it, which left me in a dilemma. Either the saying didn't make sense, so why did intelligent people say it, or I was schizophrenic or paranoid. <laughs> Those are tough choices. <laughs> Years passed, during which now and then I puzzled over my problem with the proverb. And slowly, slowly, it dawned on me that the word have has several meanings or shades of meaning, the principal one being own or possess, but one of the less common connotations is hold on to, keep. You can't keep your cake and eat it too. Oh, I get it. It's a good proverb. I am not a paranoid schizophrenic, but it seemed odd that I haven't arrived sooner at the keep meaning of have. I puzzled over that for a while, too, and finally came up with this. For one thing, it seems to me that these verbs are in the wrong order. You have to have your cake before you eat it, after all. I might have understood the saying if it was, you can't eat your cake and have it, too. <laughs> and then, another kind of confusion having to do with have. In the West Coast dialect of English I grew up with, I had cake at the party, is how we said, I ate cake at the party. You can't have your cake and eat it too is trying to tell me I couldn't eat my cake and eat it too. And hearing it that way as a kid, I thought, huh? But didn't say anything because there is no way, no possible way, a kid can ask about anything grown-ups say that the kid thinks, huh, about? So I just tried to figure it out. And once I got stuck with the illogic of the cake, you have being the cake you can't eat, the possibility never occurred to me that it was all about hoarding versus gobbling, or the necessity of choice when there is no middle way. I expect you've had quite enough cake by now. I'm sorry. But see, this is the kind of thing I think about a lot. Nouns, cake, verbs, have, words, and, use, and the uses and misuses of words, and the meaning of words, and how the words and their meanings change with time and with place, and the derivations of words from older words of other languages. Words fascinate me the way box elder beetles fascinate my friend Pard. Pard, at this point, is not allowed outside, so he has to hunt indoors. Indoors we have, at this point, no mice, but we have beetles. Oh yes, Lord, we have beetles. And if Pard hears, smells, or sees a beetle, that beetle instantly occupies his universe. He will stop at nothing. He will root in wastebaskets, overturn and destroy small fragile objects, push large heavy dictionaries aside, leap wildly in the air or up the wall, stare unmovingly for ten minutes at the unattainable light fixture in which a beetle is visible as a tiny moving silhouette, and when he gets the beetle, as he always does, he knows that you can't have your beetle and eat it too. So he eats it instantly. 
I know, though I don't really like knowing it, that not many people share this particular fascination or obsession, with words I mean, not beetles. Though I want to point out that Charles Darwin was almost as deeply fascinated by beetles as part is, though with a, di a somewhat different goal. Darwin even put one in his mouth once in a doomed attempt to keep it by eating it. It didn't work. <laughs> There's an asterisk, and it says, from Darwin's autobiography, I will give proof of my zeal one day on tearing off some old bark I saw two rare beetles and seized one in my hand, and then I saw a third and a new kind which I could not bear to lose. So I popped the one which I held in my hand into my mouth. Alas, it injected some intensely acrid fluid which burnt my tongue so that I was forced to spit the beetle out which was lost, <laughs> as was the third one. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyhow, many people enjoy reading about the meaning and history of picturesque words and phrases, but not many enjoy brooding for years over a shade of significance of the verb to have in a banal saying.